So now that we've met the concept of relativistic mass, let's now start talking about relativistic energy. So to do this, we're going to want to study the time component of our relativistic four force, which if you remember, we defined the four force as just the derivative of the four momentum with respect to proper time. And now I just want to consider the time component of this full force. So to start doing this, we're going to revisit our notion of the full force. And now if you remember, when I defined the full acceleration, we saw that the velocity, the full velocity and acceleration have to be orthogonal or Minkowski orthogonal. Basically that the you know, product of the acceleration of the velocity with the acceleration has to be zero, or we could rewrite that. So the full velocity and full acceleration are orthogonal in Minkowski space. And now we could also use that to realize that the full force is also going to be orthogonal since full force is just the mass times the acceleration. So I'm going to use that now. So I express this inner product of the force with the velocity. And I'm just writing out the terms where now I've expressed the first time component and then the other three spatial pieces, just using this kind of vectory notation for the spatial pieces. Okay, so this is just the Minkowski in a product, we have minus the time-like piece and then plus the space-like piece. So I can now use the fact that this is equal to zero to just rewrite. Now I'm going to isolate this time component as being f dot u over this thing u naught and now we can do some more rewriting. If we remember that the spatial part of our full velocity vector, which is right here, that the u has the following form. So we can realize that this u vector piece is just going to be v gamma, and then this u naught is just another c gamma. So the gammas will cancel, and we're going to be left with f now dotted with the coordinate velocity over C and then there would have been gamma and gamma there. And so now finally we know that we can express our force, just now the spatial part of the force vector using the effective force. This was how we realized the effective force. And so I can just rewrite this now in terms of the effective force which is going to give me now k dot v over c and then there's going to be just a factor of gamma. So what we've now effectively realised is that this time component of the full force is now completely specified or completely constrained by the effective force and the coordinate velocity. And so all we need to express the now the four force is just simply the three force or just the spatial force and our factor of gamma which comes from the velocity. And so we're going to explore now a little bit more what this time component is representing. And we're going to see that this time component is now somehow related to the energy. Just now to remind us, we've got that the full force, well we've now derived its time component, I'm just going to keep it as F0 for now, and then its space component, which you've seen is given by the effective force. So I'll just rewrite up here now that this time component of the full force... Okay, so to explore this in a bit more detail, let's just remember how the or one way that we could realize the full force as being the derivative of our 
for momentum with respect to our tau proper time parameter. And so we can write that this F0 component is given by the derivative of this P0 component with respect to the tau parameter. Just substituting that F0 is dP0 derivative with respect to tau. Okay, so now I'm going to manipulate this expression to turn this tau derivative into a t derivative. So what I'm going to want to do, well, there are a number of ways that you can see this. You could just use the chain rule on the left-hand side and then cancel the factor of gamma. Or if you like, you could just divide the factor of gamma and then use a, another chain rule. So I'll just do that. I'll say 1 over gamma dp0 by d tau, just divided by gamma. Now if I remember how we defined gamma as being dt by d tau, and so the inverse of gamma is just d tau by dt. And then, lo and behold, we can just use the chain rule again, or naively do some fractional calculus. But we can instead just realize that the chain rule is going to tell us that this is just the derivative with respect to t. Okay, so I can now use this to rewrite what I've got over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, just multiply through by c. It's not going to change anything. But then I'm going to have that c dp0 now by dt. Doing this manipulation over here. I've already multiplied by the c, so this is just now k dot v. So what is this thing now that we've identified? The time-like component of the four force. You can rewrite it in this way using the four momentum. And it's now just given by this kind of fairly simple dot product between now our effective force and our velocity. So how should we think about this now? Well, we have to go back to our Newtonian mechanics analogy. And if we compare this now, not with an effective force, but just with a force, we realize that what this thing k dot v is basically describing is a force times a velocity. And now as vector quantities, we would call this thing, the dot product of force times velocity, this is what we call the power. And it's a scalar quantity because it's achieved using a dot product. And so in Newtonian physics, this is what we call power. And we can realize it as now the rate of change of this thing energy with respect to time. So now if I just make the connection between our Newtonian and relativistic scenarios, this, now in the relativistic case, the effective force dotted with the velocity, this is going to be kind of like an effective power. And so looking at this expression now, we can realize that this effective power is given by now a derivative with respect to time. And so we can realize then that this thing which, being, which is being derived with respect to time is what should be our energy, because the rate of change of energy is what gives us our power. And so just by making some direct analogies with Newtonian mechanics, we can now identify, or if we like, we could take it to be a definition, that we're going to say that energy, now this is going to be the effective energy, we'll see why shortly, but just for now, note that it's coming from an effective quantity. And so the energy is this thing, C P naught, where now P naught is our time-like component of our form momentum. So we can just realize the time-like component of form momentum is this energy over C. So what is this energy now? Well, let's see, just using the definition of our form momentum, we can learn a bit more about it. So we'll leave this there for now for reference. 
that we now see. Energy is this time-like component of our fall momentum. So we had that fall momentum is the following vector, and so we can see this energy is now going to correspond to our time component. So I can realize now the energy of this particle, or whatever it is, the energy of this momentum vector is going to be this thing, C times P naught. So it's going to be a gamma N naught C squared. So this might now be probably the most famous equation of all time, and probably the most poorly stated or misinterpreted equation of all time, that energy is mc squared. And now, of course, we have this factor gamma in here, so I can realize that this gamma n naught, this is now just our effective mass. And so we've arrived at the, now the effective energy, this is going to be effective energy, remember, because it was coming from an effective force. So the effective energy is now m c squared. And so this is probably the most famous equation of all time, and also probably the most misunderstood equation of all time, because when somebody says E equals MC squared, they're forgetting to tell you what they are really meaning is effective energy is effective mass times C squared. We're then going to be able to, uh, using this, derive a better version of this energy relation. We're going to see how it's nicely related to our rest mass and our velocity. But for now, this is just simply what we've arrived at. For, or this is how we now realize energy, we kind of have to arrive at it using this effective force. And then in making our analogy with Newtonian mechanics, this expression is kind of measuring a, a change of a quantity being equal to this now effective power. And so whatever quantity is changing is going to have to correspond to our energy. And so we have identified now that our effective energy is this effective mass times c squared. And now I just want to make a really quick comment now about this expression. It is a, probably one of the most fundamental expressions in physics, but it really is now, or it's it's telling us that there is some deep and fundamental equivalence between mass and energy. Because if we just forget about this factor c squared, which was just a numerical factor, we can change it arbitrarily by changing the measurement scale that we use, we arrive at now probably an even more fundamental realization that energy is mass using the appropriate unit scale. And so this really is, was one of the turning points of modern 20th century physics, was when Einstein realized this relation between relativistic energy and the mass of a particle, and it's what's led to many of the incredible discoveries, like nuclear fission and all sorts of things like that, and is now frequently and widely used throughout particle physics. We never really talk about the masses of fundamental particles in units like grams or kilograms because it doesn't really make sense. We instead, because we're dealing with highly relativistic objects that are highly energetic, and so obviously their energy is going to significantly affect their mass in some way. Because remember, this is, of course, the effective mass. And so for extremely energetic particles, their energy is going to become much greater than their kind of rest mass energy. And so in high energy particle physics, we always talk about the masses of particles as being measured now in units of energy. So we would say something like, oh, the Higgs boson, it's a particle, it has a mass of 125 giga electron volts, or whatever giga electron volts are, they're just a, a measure of energy, but now we're using that measure of energy to express how heavy something is, 
And we can see that we're allowed to do this now because of this fundamental mass energy relation. And now quite clearly we can see this gamma is going to severely affect our mass as we start to increase, as our speed starts to increase, sorry. And so particles are going to get much, much heavier and hence much more energetic as they achieve much, much higher velocities.